Uh, hello, everyone. I think uh, we can start uh, the introductions for today as uh, more people are joining us slowly. So uh, my name is Panos. I will be your host today. I am a senior researcher at the Future Seeds Laboratory, and I work for the Architectural Cognition and Practice Group. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce today our speaker, Michael van Egermond, uh, who will give a lecture on forecasting district-wide pedestrian volumes in multi-level networks in high-density mixed-use areas, uh, which is the result of a multi-year project that uh, Michael and I worked together in, in the past, and it, uh, it is really great to have the opportunity to listen to the results of this work um, today. <coughs> Uh, um, Michael um, was trained in transport planning and obtained his master's and PhD from ETH Zurich, working here at the Singapore Teha Center, where he was previously um, a postdoctoral researcher and a project coordinator at the Engaging Mobility Group. And uh, a few years now already, he is a senior researcher at the uh, University of Applied Sciences in Northwestern Switzerland. Um, with now, without further ado, uh, Michael, it's our pleasure to have you with us today, and we're really for forward to uh, hearing about your your work. Great, uh, thank you, um, panels. Well, one more one more point for our uh, listeners: um, please add your comments in the chat. Uh, you can also uh, ask them at the end of the presentation, or otherwise, as Michael prefers. Uh, it would be really great if you can um, speak out loud as we can have a more uh, jovial conversation at the end. Thank you. And Michael, again, the floor is yours. Cool. Thank you, Panos, for this introduction. Uh, as mentioned, I would like to talk about work that we did in uh, Singapore already several years back uh, in a project together with Panos and several others, Alex Arat, Vera Helle, Pablo Achebilo, and Xu Chen Xu among others. Um, but I also would like to go into um, forecasting pedestrian flows in general. So first, I, I was not too sure about the audience. And given that this is online, it makes it even harder to gauge the audience. And so really, why do we want to forecast pedestrian flows, or why is it of relevance? Um, first of all, pedestrian mobility is one of the most, if not the most, um, environmental friendly mode of transport. There is almost no emissions involved. There's almost no space or less space involved in other modes of transport. It's healthy. It reduces congestion and pollution. If more people walk, there's less people using other modes of transport. In an environment that is comfortable and interesting for pedestrians results in these vibrant centers. And here's a picture from uh, Orchard Road. We took this already um, a long time ago. I'm a bit scared now, I think, of the year, uh, seven years back, um, that we took this picture of a juggler in Orchard Road. And you saw all these people wandering and sitting and enjoying their walk. And this positive feedback loop is something that we would like to understand. At the same time, there is no, there are not so many methods that can help us in understand the forecast pedestrian flows. This is mainly to do with the adv uh, advance of motorized transport and public transport over the years, and much of the modeling efforts and focus and understanding and funds have resulted in models for vehicular traffic and to a much lesser extent to models for pedestrians. And that gives us a lack of tools to forecast the usage of pedestrian infrastructure. And um, this is something that I, I've learned in my time in Singapore, is that numbers count. So if you had, can put a number on the amount of pedestrians walking somewhere, or the travel time gains multiplied by the number of pedestrians walking somewhere then you have a number that you can use in cost-benefit analysis, and then you have a number that you can communicate to somebody, and that's something that you can fund policy on. Just to give you an idea, and I drew up some figures for Switzerland last night, 
Um, how much do people walk? Uh, that's difficult. You have a mode share that you sometimes hold here. Here I've presented a daily distance. So 8% of the daily distance in Switzerland is by foot. Uh, and to a lesser extent by bicycle, but let's say by foot. Um, but at the same time, people spend 40% of their time walking. I'm not going to give you this trick question that we give during lectures. Why, why is this? It's because walking is a much slower mode of transport as compared to other modes. Um, but 40% of the time spent is walking. And 40% of the trip stages, so that includes a walk to a public transport stop, um, is by foot, which gives you just an indication how relevant um, uh, going by foot is as a mode of transport. Specifically in Asia and Singapore, there are district level urban developments. And um, some pictures for the viewers from uh, outside of Asia, you see, um, here, the same street that I just showed you, but then different images of the pedestrian network underground. Almost all the pictures are, are taken on Orchard Road. And you see that there's this fusion of indoor-outdoor. So there's this indoor network, which is really a network by itself, but it's also part of the network. There's different levels where people move upon. There's people move underground, people move at grade, people move elevated between buildings. And in these images, you see different ownerships. Top left, you see two shopping malls where the ownership changes. Um, you see uh, public, which is this transit stop that you might see on the bottom right. And these are all interconnected, which gives very difficult challenges to planners. And what more is that these developments are connected to transit and these transit lines uh, here on Orchard Road, there is 4,000 people coming per two to four minutes. They're arriving at a train station and they need to disperse and they need to go somewhere. Now, changes in the street layout are very difficult to do ex ante. It's almost impossible to, once you've built, it's there. And especially if it's underground, or above ground, it's even more difficult to change a repurposed space because the width is already provided for. Whereas above ground, you might play around with the placing of the trees and how many lanes you dedicate to buses and how many lanes you get dedicate to cars and to pedestrians and cyclists. Once you construct something underground or below uh, above ground, it's very difficult to change this. So an understanding of pedestrian flows can help planners and setting guidelines. And this is also what motivated some of the research that I showed. So which tools now do we have at hand to forecast pedestrian flows? The first, and this is a bit my background where I'm uh, educated in, is that we have a transport demand modeling process, which is called the four-step model. You might've heard of it. And this is a very, very rigorous process. It's well documented, it's well understood over the last 40 years, maybe now, 40 to 50 years, where there are four steps in modeling. You generate trips, so each zone, that's first important to understand, there's a zone, which is a larger district that produces trips. These trips have to go somewhere to other zones. Once you know, once you know these flows, you can say, well, as X people might go by car, X people might go by public transport, and the other X percent of people we forget because we don't forecast those, those are pedestrians. And then we assign this to a network. Now, this process is not used to the extent for pedestrians. There's several reasons for that because it's very computational intensive to compute for Switzerland, which has maybe 4,000 zones for vehicles. Um, and Singapore had uh, over 1,000 model zones in the transport model. Um, to also include this resolution or, the, or this level of granularity that exists for pedestrians. Pedestrians have different networks. 
pedestrians have different preferences. And just out of computational purposes, you exclude a part of the process. Nevertheless, it's good to keep these steps into mind because we're going to contrast this with an other approach in the next slide. So what you can also do is to forecast the travel times per link or to forecast the travel or the number of people walking along a link or the number of vehicles driving along a link is to use something which is called a direct demand model. And direct demand models, they have also been known since the 70s, but they've been a bit forgotten in favor of this more advanced process that we have. And here is a formula. The only formula that I uh, that I show today, don't worry, is um, where you have a regression model, a pedestrian count Y or a pedestrian flow Y, which you aim to forecast by a series of variables dubbed X, and we know how much each variable contributes to the um, dependent variable. And we say that these flows are then a function of um, I'll just open up um, um, are a function of social demographic characteristics along a link or in an area in an area with a high employment density. We might expect more people walking, uh, built environment characteristics. If there is a high commercial land usage or if there is a school nearby a link, we might expect more people and the role of a link in a network. If a link is more central, we might expect more people. This approach has been used to forecast pedestrian flows. I'm not the first or we're not the first here, but it also has been used in speeds for vehicles. And it's a well understood approach where you circumvent some of the steps of the um, four step model. So you circumvent, for instance, the distribution or whatever, you circumvent these steps and you're just interested in the final outcome, which is the dependent variable Y that we have. Now, let me just open my pointer. Um, good. So now if we have this family of direct demand models, we have two schools of thought. And again, one comes from transport and the other comes from um, more urban planning, I would say, uh, from the space syntax school of thought. In transport, what people did is they looked at the accessibility of a link. And what that means is they count the number of amenities in proximity to a link and then use that to correlate that or estimate a model of pedestrian flow. In transport, this relies heavily on using metric distance, something that I will get back to later. Now, an other school of thought is more driven by network topology. Space influences what we do. Uh, and there's two measures that come here. Um, there's one is called something which is called between a centrality, which tells us how centrally located a link is in a network. And what is different is that these methods use something called steps as distance metric. How many steps is a link or a segment? Uh, how, how far is that from me? The more steps, the less uh, the less influence it will have and the less central it is. Or you can think of this something called angular distance, something that I will show in a bit, is that the more turns I would make is how far farther something is expected to be, how much, how further something is expected to be. Now, important to the difference between these two approaches is that one includes land use. So there is something which land use drives transport flow. Whereas this school of thought says the network drives flow. 
and the presence of a network simply indicates that there is land use and i know that this is a controversial topic but and i'm happy to discuss that afterwards um, if people would like to discuss this now you can also combine these ideas and you can include land use into your network topology so you use a weight um, you say that my link has a certain weight and this weight um, represents something that is happening along a link the most basic approach is to say that longer links so the length of a link is used drive more or create more pedestrians create more activity but you can also say that commercial land use drives more activity and what you can do and this is very exciting is that you can combine different origin and destination weights um, and you can include distance decay something much more advanced um, into these network topology measures and this is something that i will show in the remainder of this talk now to make it a bit more complicated is that we have this notion of generalized travel costs transport planners are very well aware of this concept that we know that not every minute is equal a minute spent with friends is much more fun than a minute spent at work maybe for other people maybe the other way around and the same is that a minute spent in a crowded public transport vehicle might be perceived different than in a train where I have a seat with nobody next to me or waiting on a platform. And this is something that we use in cost benefit analyses all the time um, is that we have different perceptions of travel time dependent on where I am and what I'm doing. And this is very well documented. Just think of yourself booking your next uh, train or flight and how you consider whether you want to transfer yes or no. Now, also for pedestrians, is that a meter is not a meter. So you might say that a meter along a comfortable route might be perceived as much shorter than a meter walking along a very busy road with lots of noise. And this is something that has been shown in different studies, mainly in uh, transport studies where we see that greenery shortens travel time commercial activity along a link shortens perceived distance but also if we need to use an escalator or a lift or whatever or a, a case of stairs this increases our costs um, for instance transport of london uses figures that say a staircase is equal to 50 meters now, if you translate again to costs, 50 meters would be, and now this is from the top of my head, would be something of like 30 seconds perceived. Whereas, and that's only six meters of staircase. So it's perceived as five times as long or almost 10 times as long as walking along a regular link. And this influences how attractive some links are. And this influences in turn our route search. And this influences which routes we use, and then where we can expect flows. And this is also something that we did a, a while back in Singapore. So now our question is, when we use different link costs, can we create better pedestrian forecast models? So just here an example. Um, this is a sketch of a Raffles Place MRT. You might not see it. Um, but in Raffles Place MRT, you have this beautiful straight hallway going down to um, Lao Pa Sat. And then you have here to, what is it called again? This is a while back. To Ocean, Ocean Tower, something called Ocean Tower. And then you have the high tower, one Raffles. And now nobody, or if you're there, the question is whether people would use this route, which is slightly shorter or whether people use a route with less angular change. There's only one turn, and this is beautiful, and this is wide. And now this is one of the questions do we have. Which route do people prefer? Do people prefer to take less turns? Do people prefer to take 
straight line or the many turns. And now, if people prefer this, then we would need to make this, for instance, wider or more comfortable or higher that we can cope with flows. Whereas if people prefer this way, we would need to make this wider, etc. Now think about your own trip through Raffles Place MRT, and you will note that during commute hour, many people pass through a 1.5 meter corridor here um, instead of taking the six meter wide corridor. Just, just uh, you can go there tomorrow morning and then have a look. So in this case, and these are commuters, they prefer simply to take the shortest path, which is only like 10 meters shorter than the, uh, than the beautiful path. So now as an analyst and as a researcher, I have different choices to make. Uh, which distance metric do I use in my analysis? Do I use angular distance, metric distance? Do I use something called perceived distance? Which measure should I incorporate? Betweenness or accessibility? And then there's something called radius. How far uh, should I look when I calculate these measures? Good. Now, keeping this in mind, and if you now know this outline, you think, well, okay, I'm going to start. And there's all these different softwares that you can use. And this doesn't make it much easier. And I'm not going to into depth. I'm happy to email. We use many of these um, tools also for our teaching and for our practice. And you have differences in the platform that you can run these tools on. Um, you have differences in the type of measures that they generate. You have differences in the speed. You have differences whether weights are possible. You have whether you can incorporate it into a spatial data flow, like attaching data to links. Is that possible directly? Is it free? That might be important. Um, is it suitable for planning? And what I mean there is you have tools that work with OpenStreetMap, um, which are very good but you cannot run your own analysis. You cannot add a link. Do you have differences in how well something is documented? Um, there are different tools that are very well documented like the play syntax tool or the SDNA is quite well documented. Whereas certain R libraries like SD Planer, you might need to search in the code, which is possible because it's open source to um, look at what the code is doing. And now I'm working with a PhD student here in Switzerland, and he just prefers to write his own. So that's if, you have a, if you're a PhD student, again, you can write your own code to do this type of analysis, et cetera. Good, I have two case studies, and dependent on time, I will present on both, or I just will present one of them. And the first one is Singapore, as promised in the title. Now, this is a picture of 1914 of Singapore. And you will note that the street network didn't change at all. This is just to give you an idea, it's very hard to change planning. And people from London also know that London's network didn't change much between different areas. So Raffles Place is right here. And what has changed, of course, is the density. And what has changed is, um, that there is a whole new island here, Marina Bay, uh, that there is a whole new uh, land here, and that there is an underground network, etc. But in general, the net, the, the Edgray network didn't change at all over these years. So in our project, which was funded by um, the URA, the LTA, and HDB in an L2 and SC project, is we had several objects objectives. And I'm going to talk about only one, which is about quantifying pedestrian flows. And we did this in four areas. One is Raffles Place that I just showed. Another one is Jurong East, um, which is located in the east as the name indicates, but which is a planned environment. We have Orchard Road, um, very commercial, and we have Tampanese, which is more residential. So when we set out, uh, the first thing that we needed was pedestrian networks. 
And what we did is we obtained networks from different uh, sources. We drew networks, we did field visits, and is, um, we digitized these walkways in a spatial database. This was not a 2D network or a 2.5D network, but this was a true 3D network. Um, in this case here for Jurong East, the red lines indicate indoor network um, with bridges between different buildings. We have escalators. Um, we have uh, the outdoor network. And what we have is something um, which is up for discussion is uh, sidewalks. Um, we explicitly chose to include these as these roads are three lanes in each direction with a fence in the middle that prevents crossing. So we consider this as truly separate walkways despite them moving along the same line of sight. Now, how we worked, and this was a, a painstaking or was a painful process, how, how to get here is that we wanted to have this 3D. We wanted to have data attached to the network. And what we finally chose is a proprietary solution um, with S3 RGS server, um, which we, and where we use an open source database on the back end. Uh, but S3 allowed us to draw some in Autodesk AutoCAD 3D and it allowed us to attach data to the network. At the same time, by using Postgres, we could use uh, QJS for some visualizations. We could use R for modeling, and we could use other open source uh, tools just to interact with the data. We could write queries to update, and we weren't too dependent on the S3 environment. Now, this is a graph, and this is something that I will get back to later, is that why do you draw the indoor network? This is commercial. You shouldn't care about this indoor network. Um, this is just where people go shopping. But it is truly part of the, network, of the publicly accessible network. And simply most people walk there. It's integrated with transport. And this just shows how much length of the network per site is indoor and outdoor. And for instance, in um, Jurong East, what we see is that, and this is kilometers, these figures that you see here, is that 36 kilometers of the network within 400 meters of the main transit station there is indoor, is private, and only 17 kilometers is outdoor. Now, even if we move further away from the train station, we see that eight kilometers is indoor still, and 36 is outdoor. Our radius is getting larger. This is something that happens. And we see this is directly integrated with the transit hub. So this is where we need to plan for. This is where we need to look at as well. What we did, and this is what we wanted to have a pedestrian count. And uh, unfortunately, we couldn't tap into towns for uh, that shopping malls have. They have their own counting systems, but we needed to install our own devices. And just thinking of the process again, this was a painstaking process because we wanted to employ counters in um, private developments and we want to employ the farm. Um, I need to share my screen again, right? No technical issue. Cool. But we're back. So counting. And what we did is we did manual counting with manual gate counts for 10 minutes. And we uh, did this for three days. So we had, at the end, we had approximately 80 counts per site, which is a, a 
for modeling, it's not a high number as compared to vehicular uh, transport, but it is quite high for pedestrian study. And this was all pre-COVID, so we had sufficient. Cool, so what we did is, what we did is we generated different network measures, we used different rates, um, we used metro distance, we used perceived distance, we used angular distance, et cetera, and we used um, accessibility metrics. We generated two phase between these metrics. This is uh, something that I will show in the next slide. And uh, we use different radii. So what we did is we use different radii to be able to capture distance decay so that we can say uh, between this between zero and 200 meters is more important than between this between 200 and 400 meters. And I will show you briefly a comparison how these different methods compare. First, this two phase between this method. And um, this is new, that's why I, I chose to show this, is that we have, for instance, an origin, an MRT station, and we know that 100 people arrive there in a certain amount of time. And we know that 80 people go to this destination, the hospital, um, and 20 people might go to another destination. Now, what we would do in a normal network analysis is that we would just simply say I have origin links and destination links and these two magic numbers indicate to me that these both links are equally important or almost equally important without using weights at all but now I do have a priori knowledge on origin and destination. So why shouldn't we use this? And then I can say, for instance, I know that along this link, there will be 100 people walking. Along this link, there will be 80 people walking. And along this link, there will be 20 people walking. This is an example of perfect knowledge, right? On route choice and network. Um, it's a very simple example. Key point is that we use land use or we use land use and bus stops and trans stuff to inform our between this metric. And we can use different origin destinations. Now, in our case, we chose not to use um, this perfect knowledge, but rather we represented uh, MRT station as one um, because we didn't know or we, choose, we chose not to use the amount of passengers arriving. And what we did use is a certain G of A. And now we get a magic number, but this magic number now is between this figure, 0 0.8 and 0 0.2, does represent that this link is likely to have more pedestrians walking because there's a higher weight at this end. Now, fortunately for us, we had very good, rather good knowledge on the uh, land usage, and we use different land use types. So we calculated these metrics for uh, retail, office, uh, residential units. And now we have a series of links or a series of metrics for each uh, origin destination path. So I know I use this trip generation, something from this transport demand modeling process, and I know something about trip attraction, and this is something that I put into a model that I will estimate later. First into correlations, and later into a model. Just to indicate um, how such a metric looks like, that you better understand this, this is the betweenness but from an MRT station, which is located right there, smack in the middle, with uh, two retail, two of these different shopping malls. And we have, here we have the JQ with the ice skating ring, if it's still there. Um, here we have JAM, and here we have IMM, and here we have 
the location formerly known as Big Box. I'm not sure what's there now. Um, and what we did is we counted at all these red lines. We used these different methods to count. We counted at different distances and we counted at different levels. Okay, just to know where there would be, uh, how much this between this metric influences um, the footfall. Now, just getting to the key point here is that when we use three different model types, one is a model simply um, this classical space syntax model where we have length weighted angular change between this. Uh, another model where we use accessibility, which indicates the proximity of amenities to each link. And we use this two phase between this metric. And now what I show here is the row square, a goodness of fit. We use different goodness of fit measures. I chose here to use um, goodness of fit method uh, called the row square. This is something I will show the model estimates later, but including um, land use in Jerome East dramatically improved our model fit. So if we use a between this metric without land use, we get a row square of 0.17. If we use land use in our model, in our between these metrics, we get a row square of almost 0.7. And this is a trend that we saw almost in all sides. Um, when, we, when we include land use in our between this metric, we get a very high uh, row square, rather good models. That we estimate. A Orchard Road model uh, that also works quite well without including that. And very exciting to see when the Raffles plays in this old district, we get a very low row square, almost like uh, you would throw away this model um, using angular change as a between this metric. Uh, but you get a better row square. Still far from the other sites. Um, we can discuss that later why that is when we use these two phase between these metrics. And this is something that we fitted on average weekday peak flows. Well, how does that, such a model look like? And I've chosen to show you two models. This is Tampanese. This is a top view, not ideal, but it does, the, it does the trick. We have the MRT station here and a dark color indicates how many people we expect there. And now here we use an accessibility model. And what an accessibility model does, and you see that beautifully, let me just think right here in this area, is it uses the characteristics of adjacent links on each link. So it's not very sensitive to between this. And there we have a beautiful landscape where we see here we have lots of activity, lots of pedestrians, but it's equal on all links, judging by the color. And then some, it, it drops off very gradually. Now, if we use between this metrics, what between this does, it shows, a, it searches the shortest path. And, um, I'll show that on the next slide right here. Now, this is for two sites. And this is Jerome East. And here we have a pedestrian flow um, from the uh, train station right here to the different developments. And it goes right there. And here we have a good flow or here we have the pedestrian flow continuing to the final mall in the area. Now, it's important to understand that between this only results in one shortest path. So what I mean by that is that there might be a second path going outdoor, but this path will not be considered in the route search between the train station and this mall. There will be only one path leading over the 
uh, jaywalk over these bridges. <coughs> and the same for Orchard Road is, and then I need to twist my head uh, a bit here, is that we have, you see, this is Iron Orchard right here, uh, the MIT station, and then we have the flows going to Nikon City, uh, different locations. One thing that we see is that these, these pedestrian flows, they're going through buildings. And this is something that I tried to say earlier. We need to plan for these because these are the most important routes that people take, not only to a single building, but also to subsequent buildings. So we need to plan for these links. Now, just that you see which arrivals we put in our, into our model, and this is a selection. I think we have a, I had a bit more is that shows us that dependent on the site, different variables contribute differently to pedestrian flow. For instance, we have in Jurong East, the highest contribution is provided by retail, um, whereas in Revels Place, the highest contribution is not surprisingly um, by office land usage. Another thing that you would see if you spend a lot, bit longer looking at this is that there is something called um, distance decay is that 200 meters contributes most then we have 38 which is a bit less then we have 25 MIT to retail which means links that are retail links that are further away from the train station get less foot flow footfall from the train station and then further away we have almost nothing but at the same time there is nothing there so this is driven by spatial structure in Orchard Road, you don't see the same trend that, that sharply, especially not near to the train station, which has something to do with um, that we have difficulties with employing counters very close to the train station. So this effect might be there. And this is the difficulty. If I use these two phase between these metrics, I need to have counts at all these different land use combinations. And something that we can discuss later if you want. Now I spoke about this distance and this is one site where I showed the goodness of it. And we didn't see, we didn't get clear indications which distance metric works best, unfortunately. So we see that metric distance actually performs quite well judging by this row square. We see that angular distance doesn't, uh, does well, but we also see that perceived link distance works well. And it is very sensitive to how we attach our land use to the links, and it's very sensitive to network topology. So maybe drawing a very detailed network, um, drawing a very detailed network makes it very hard for these between these metrics to find the, the correct route at the end. And introducing these different distance metrics makes it also more difficult. Uh, but we see that angular distance does it, as I mentioned, rather well in this case, in this side that I show. Now, what time do we have in the chat? Now, you can also do this for other areas in planning. This is a, an area called Dreispitz in Basel. Um, there's a train station right here, and oh, wait, let me see. I need to check the orientation north. Uh, yes, there's a train station right here, and this has this very strange layout. And this strange layout is because of the railway. There's a railway coming in, and all these streets have tracks to load and unload. Now, this is not happening anymore, and now the question is, or this area is being redeveloped. And in this case, we simply didn't have counts. But what we did have was number of transit passengers arriving at different stops. We had approximately the number of planned people in each building, number of jobs. Um, we had where the car parks were. And now the question is, can you support us using this method? Which, what are the most important links in the network? Um, and can we attract people to this rail rail track? which currently looks like beautiful as in this image. And can we make that the main pedestrian 
prove them. So what we did is, what we do is, and this is something that people in the world are common with, we have two networks and we ran a current situation. And we looked at the current situation right here and we see, well, people don't want to take this railway track. They're not using it for whatever reason, but while people are not using it, our analysis indicates that people will not use it. So we might need to rethink our network. And what you do then, and this is something that you do iteratively with planners, is you say, well, we might add a new link here, or better still, we could add a new link through an existing plot. And this is again where private meets public. How can we make this link more attractive than it appears on people's path? Um, or can we even make an upgrade to a plot where we can route people through a building? At the same time, what such an image shows you is where shouldn't I prioritize infrastructure at the moment? And it clearly shows if I need to set priorities at the moment, better not to do it on this side because I don't expect my pedestrians here. It's too far from the stop. Um, we have many people arriving by car here, but may probably we can better use our funds to improve it on this side. Just as a case study to show, well, I don't need these elaborate networks. I can also do it for an existing site without pedestrian counts, simply using assumptions on transit passengers, a real number, the n number of jobs, a real number. And then my between this metric will yield me a number that I can directly use. Just as a summary, um, is that what we see is that pedestrian flows, they occur indoor and outdoor, uh, especially what we saw in Singapore is indoor and understanding of the flow through and between private developments is necessary. And these developments start at the MRT station <coughs> and go to retail office and retail to retail. Now, we as planners should aim to account for these flows and plan for these flows, despite that these are off our usual, uh, outside of our comfort zone. And it might not be everywhere the case, but still um, it's not in the public realm, which makes it a different mindset. Now, when setting out guidelines for developments in districts around MRT stations, it's clear that people prefer these direct paths. And this makes it incredibly difficult. Where would you plan a district like Orchard Road at one go? You don't do that, right? It's a process of years. And this is a challenge for phase developments. Um, when you want to set standards for widths, how wide should a walkway be? You might want to set a standard for height. But you also need to set out a standard for connection points. And these connection points, to make it more difficult, are on different levels. And that is a tremendous challenge. And I'm not involved in these challenges, as I, I'm, not, I'm more into research than into really into this hands on planning. But what you need to do is you need to design this network. And developers should build around a network eventually. And that makes it uh, very difficult, especially because it's vertical. So it's the same as with the Manhattan grid or with the other grids of planned networks is that we need to consider how does my network look like and inside each plot that I want to be redeveloped by a private developer. Now, I don't see uh, why you shouldn't put land use into your network measure. Unless it's not available, incorporating land use in your metric makes complete sense. And there's multiple tools that can do this now. We use SDNA, but um, Urban Network Analysis Toolbox can also do this now. Um, at the same time, and this is a real difficulty that we had, is that not all land uses are equal. And this is something that we will do in the next study now here in Switzerland is how can I predict 
the number of people entering and leaving a store. For instance, I have a Uniqlo. This is the Uniqlo in Somerset, day of opening or something. Huge queue outside, but you know Uniqlo's tend to be very, very busy, like the H&M, etc. At the same time, we have a Louis Vuitton shop. There is a queue, I know, but this queue is not the same queue, uh, or there is a queue in Singapore for Louis Vuitton. But it's not the same queue, and it doesn't attract the same footfall as a Food Republic or as a Uniqlo. And now you need to think about, if I want to model these flows on these level, this level of granularity, you really need to take into account this detailed land use. And this is a function of the type of retail. It's a function of the visibility in the network. It's a function of the integration in the network or the accessibility. And to make it more complicated, it's a function of the betweenness. There is a self-reinforcing loop probably. If the shop is located along a certain link, um, people would simply just walk in because it's there. So there's this reinforcement loop. And to make it even more complicated, developers have their own science on where to put different shops to improve um, footfall at different locations. Another thing that I would like to highlight is this between this metric, which is very sensitive to how you draw the network. Now, um, for instance, Crispin Cooper has put in work into random link costs, where you say, well, I don't know exactly what my link costs are, but I sample them from a distribution. And here I said, well, these are just three examples. I have here three costs along different links. Now I sample this and I have multiple analyses. And it might be that this path here is 80% of the time on the shortest path. And this path here will be 20% of the time on the shortest path. And by doing so, I get better between these metrics. And by doing so, I account for uncertainty in travel times, which can be due to traffic lights, for instance. And I can account for differences in taste preferences between different people. But of course, this takes much longer to run. One run in our case took maybe four minutes for our networks. Now, if I want, want to run 100, uh, and between this analysis, 100 times, um, even with parallelization, I might still need 10 times as long for uh, 100 or for 100 between this analysis. But I do see that this is really a, a way forward in using between this and getting better between. Good. I'm happy to. Um, discuss. I didn't hope that I took up too much of your time. Um, if you have any questions, um, please ask them now in the chat or in the discussion, uh, or just drop me an email if you have any questions. Great. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Michael. This was a fascinating talk. Um, uh, please join me in giving Michael a virtual round of applause uh, for sharing with us both uh, the theoretical underlying um, uh, principles behind spatial network analysis and all, also how Michael has been applying these methods in Singapore and Switzerland. Um, are there any questions for Michael? I think he presented a very rich presentation. Um, you can either voice them. I can already see one question from Tanvi on the chat. Yeah, uh, that was just uh, to, I just want to clarify, Michael, you showed three models, accessibility, space syntax, and then a combined model, right? So when yeah. you're talking about accessibility, that is weighted by the GSA, correct? Yes, exactly. So that's Please. a significant improvement, even after weighting by GSA, when you include the space syntax measures. Yes, in most cases, it, it is. Yeah. It is a very... Um, Significant improvement. It has, yeah, I can go into the details, but it has to do with uh, with accessibility. All links will get all links in close proximity to each other will get the same weight, and this is something um, where between is or this this between this metric uh, only would attach weight to a single link. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. 
So I do think that accessibility is a very good metric to forecast other things like how many people might go somewhere or how many people would linger somewhere. But I think it can serve very well. But to forecast uh, pedestrian flows, um, in our case, accessibility did not work that well. We have one question from Iwana Stavrulaki from Chalmers University, uh, who is asking, how do you exactly calculate perceived distance? Yeah, thank you for that question. And I realize now that I didn't put a slide in the appendix on that. Um, what we do is, if I have my network, yeah, this is a good example. What I do is that the most simple case is that I say that a level change in my network costs uh, something more. So in this case, this is above grade. I might say that this is perceived as one. So this here, I multiply the distance by one. And now I know that an escalator, which is located somewhere in this building, is perceived as a distance multiplied by five. So it gets longer. And now if I use a route search algorithm, uh, I have different weights on my edges and uh, a link will be perceived, uh, will not be included in the shortest path. So that's the most simple case. And I think that verticality is something that has is not up to discussion as much. Um, and you can say that this represents different things. This represents that you don't know the path because it's on a different level, because you don't see the path, or it can simply because you dislike climbing the staircase. Now what we did in Singapore is we did a stated preference study and we showed people lots of images on different streets. And we asked whether people would be willing to detour or take a sort of path to avoid uh, for instance, a route along a busy road, and we saw that people would say, well, I prefer walking along an internet corridor, or I prefer walking uh, along a street with shops, above a street without shops. And you can also put that into your network, and you say, well, a street with shops is perceived as 16% less, so I reduce my weight of my link by 16% because there are shops along, if it's along a major road with lots of noise, I increase the distance by 16%. Now these numbers are not universal. And um, there's no universal road as the climatic conditions are different, preferences are different. Um, but you do see that in, in London, I think a staircase, as I said, was perceived as 50 meters. And in Singapore, they found approximately the same. So that you can try to include that as well. Is that clear, Iona? Ah, no worries. We have um, another from Dan, I'm not sure if you saw this. Uh, yeah, I see it now. What are the variables used for the weightages and how are they derived? So what we use is we use, in this case, in this image, what you see here is you see, for instance, we use whether there's an MRT station. And what we do is we say there's an MRT station at this link. Um, that's weight one. It doesn't matter too much which weight I use because I use a regression model after. Now, for GFA is what we have. For this development, we know what is the actual, not GFA, but the net floor usage by land use. So we know how many shops are there. We know how many restaurants are there um, by square meters. And now we make an assumption, and this is simply a, a data assumption. We distribute this um, proportionally according to length length in the building. So each level in a building has the same amount of GFA, and that's what we use as a weight. Now that means that a longer link within a building 
has more weight because there's more shops or there's more GFA according to our method. But between the buildings, if this building has more GFA, so if there's more surface within a building, um, this will have per meter, it might have more GFA than this building. Mm -hmm. Now what you can do is you can, um, instead of that, you can use trip generation rates and you can say, I know that so many, that 10 square meters of office generates one person and I can use that one person as a metric. Um, what we did is, and this is something in Orchard Road, is we really had difficulties with the we had difficulties with exactly what I show here. So you have, for the people familiar, I'm not sure which dam this is, but we have um, people uh, here underground and we have people above ground. But both shops have the same square footage. So in our model, it assumes that both shops generate the same amount of people. And our predictions were really a bit off when we um, used a homogeneous distribution. So in this case, we simply said, there is a luxury mall, which is above ground, which is the case. And then we have a other mall, which is below ground. And we um, attach a bit more GFA to that to represent that there is more football generated by the model below. So what did we include at the end of our model is we included these factors that you see here. You see MRT to office, MRT to residences, MRT to retail. You see retail to retail. Then on the other page, there would be bus stops and there would be um, simply a link to retail, uh, for instance, and link to uh, MRT. And these are the variables that we included in the, in the in the model. Well, we have uh, one more question from Tanvi, I think. Yeah, I'm just uh, curious, like uh, if you have any broad general understanding of methods of doing this pedestrian flow analysis based on the land use and district type, because I see it's very different for all different, the four different district types, right? The office district, mixed use, more residential and more commercial. So how is it different uh, when you use different methods in these? So we can, and this is what we did is, uh, I estimated like a combined model for Tampines and Jerome, and that worked. The model fit is less good, but it's still acceptable. That means that we put these two together, these two columns, we put these together. Mm -hmm. um, so they're not that different in that sense, that they generate the same amount of footfall. Uh, and you can combine it. You just get, because you have a larger heterogeneity in your variables, you can uh, generate, uh, you can get a model that has less predictive power. Now- But is there is a reason, I mean, I, the previous slide with the, where Raffles model fit was 0 0.01. That was yeah. really a drastic difference. Mm. Yeah, this is a different, this is, with Raffles, I feel that we have difficulties because we don't use random link costs. What we um, did is we counted it, for instance, at intersections in Raffles, and we counted at both sides of the road. And I feel that, uh, this between this metric, as I said, is very sensitive to uh, what is my shortest path. There is only one shortest path from origin to destination. But in real life, your shortest path will depend on whether a traffic light is green or red. You might say, I take this route because uh, I don't have to wait two minutes for the traffic light. So I take a different route. But in our model, we don't have this um, because we have these sidewalks. Um, that that didn't work too well. That idea of only one shortest path. Whereas in Orchard Road and Jerome East, this network, there is almost no, you, you really model these lines of sight because there's only one corridor. And um, that really helps 
in getting this good model fit. And the Raffles Place network is much messier because of the sidewalks and also because of the train station, which is very difficult. But there's much more heterogeneity in tastes of people of the routes that they take. And I feel that that's the issue there. Uh, but this is something that we want to look into for. Uh, Mike, if I may, I, I have a question as well about the um, transferability of these models, because in a way you show that, you know, we can get very high quality predictions by adding more information about GFA, calibrating the between us. Um, what was your experience with, for example, translating some of those thoughts in, in a new environment where you don't have as many pedestrian counts to calibrate them? Does it matter? Do you get, how do planners uh, uh, utilize that information? It's a, so the case that I showed for Basel is we don't have any counts. It's an assumption. And I think the first thing that you see in these analyses is how about we know that it's very, at least for me, because I do lots of network analysis and I'd never find the results surprising um, because you think, oh, well, I would know what is happening here. Um, mm -hmm. And then you start thinking closer. And then for instance, this conclusion that we don't need to intervene immediately in a district. This is something that I wouldn't look at because I always look at the high flows and not at the low flows. And then a planner would say, ah, but then I can prioritize, for instance, mm -hmm. by using this. Um, another thing is that this really shows, and this is now clear on this image, this is a very, this intersection is really terrible. There's only one crossing. It's, um, there's only one traffic light instead of four. It's, it's really a, a bad intersection. And now it really becomes obvious to the transport planners, okay, now we need to do something about this intersection if we expect all these flows. And this is without counts. What we do here is we count uh, bus stop to uh, jobs and bus stop to students and we train stop, et cetera. We have four different types of flows and we add these together. Um, so it, it, it does help in an understanding, um, but you do get questions in which routing algorithm do you use, or which distance do you use? Um, but it's, I would say that it's very interactive in that sense, that where do I need to add a link? It's much more a, in a discussion fashion. Yeah. But uh, the, the method with the land use, it's, it's very sensitive, as I said, to having the right counts at the right locations. And this makes it very difficult with the two phase between these metrics, especially if you use the small distance bins, because then you need to have a count at each distance bin to be able to estimate a model, uh, a parameter for that uh, two phase between this combination. But and you might not have a count at hand. But your general takeaway is that when we can, we should be using GFA. Because GFA can... or and what Andres did recently, uh, Andres Sefcik, he did a paper where he used trip generation rates um, mm -hmm. as, a, as a method. But I, I feel that I don't understand why you shouldn't use it, especially not in environments that might not have been grown so organically like uh, mm -hmm. old city environments where a high density of links represents a high density of footfall that you expect. Mm. Um, that's so that's why you should use these methods simply to get an understanding of. And what this method of course does is it shows you the sum of shortest paths, right? It's not one shortest path, but here it shows the sum of shortest paths between all these buildings here from this origin. And this is something that might be harder to compute from the top of your head, you might be able to compute one shortest path combination from this district to this university, but not to all these small destinations. And this is what it shows you, the cumulative outcome of this. Um, and perhaps one last closing question. I don't see any question from the 
uh, audience. So how do you think this approach of computationally um, estimating pedestrian flows and pedestrian activity fits with the broader uh, uh, vision and, and mission to make cities more pedestrian friendly, walkable? Um, you know, we hear about the 15 minute city as an approach for urban planning. How does this complement our current methods since you have both uh, research and practical experience? First, I think it's still, and this is a challenge also when working with students and with other people, these methods, um, they allow you to zoom out too far. And what I mean by that is if you're a pedestrian, it's about the micro level environment. It's about these small things that matter. It's about sweating at a traffic light for two minutes. It's about a car passing by too fast. And it's maybe not about this 400 meter walk or what is this 800 meter walk. And these GIS methods, they make you zoom out very far and it's still not the perspective that a pedestrian has, All right? And that I think is a real challenge. And to plan for pedestrian actually means going out there and experiencing the world as a pedestrian and not only as yourself, but using different glasses and walking with a pair of glasses of a child and with an elderly person, um, a couple, a group, and to experience the environment in that way. And I think, still think that you should plan for pedestrian infrastructure that way, and maybe not on this very high zoomed out level. Um, a challenge with these methods is still the mode choice question is we assume now pedestrians being constant and there's not more pedestrians being added if we make a better walkable environment. The cake mm. remains the same. Yeah. And we would like to get this pedestrian cake to get bigger. Or if there is a bicycle infrastructure, uh, you might compete with the bicycle. And these direct demand models, they don't, it's very difficult. The cake remains the cake, uh, and I divide the cake over my area, but the cake doesn't get a wedding cake or whatever with multiple, it doesn't get bigger. And now this is something where you need to have feedback. And you say, if I have a more friendly environment here, and if I do all these interventions, I will mm -hmm. get more pedestrians. And this is something which these models still not have, these direct demand models don't have very well. And which is a very important question because that's, as I said, now I can do a cost benefit analysis maybe for this somehow to make this improvement and get more people, but I don't get more people in general. Hmm. Um, that's a very difficult question to answer. This is also a very important question to answer. But on the other hand, it's just a question for why not do it? If we build infrastructure for cars, which cost millions or billions, we can do an improvement which costs a couple of thousand for pedestrians. Thank you, that's very insightful. <clears throat> Are there any more questions from our audience? Seems we've, uh, you've uh, done a great job answering all of our questions. Um, so please uh, join me all uh, with another round of virtual applause. And Michael, thank you so much for joining us today from Basel, Switzerland, uh, all around the world where we are um and present this work that has been very important both for 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 us for uh, fcl for the pedestrian Poverty project and also for the world of urban planning at large uh, it's kind of putting together the pieces of the puzzle on pedestrian mobility thank you very much Palaza. thank you all for uh, staying until uh, this time of the evening for you guys and also, uh, one round of thanks to Helen and to Anjana for organizing this talk and coordinating with everyone. Um, we'll have a series of talks at FCL every Wednesday, uh, coordinated by Tanvi, Helen, Anjana, and our colleagues. So um, for those of you that join us from outside FCL, uh, you can subscribe and uh, join future research talks. Thank you.